When Dr. William Birkin pitched his massive tipper tantrum, which led to the end of many people in Raccoon City, the damage wasn't just localized to the sewers and the surface. Deep below the sewers in the Umbrella Labs, the scientists and researchers trapped would feel the effects of their containment procedures failing. As some were turned outright just into shambling infected in their beds, others had the misfortune of being extremely close in proximity to their experiments they were currently working on at that time. Specifically in the instance, those trapped with the plant BOW area would have that plant break free and begin using the researchers as nourishment. Some would attempt to stop the plant, but would succumb either to the lacerations brought on by Plant 43 or the virus itself. Specifically in those that were turned later, we see the plant had other options at its disposal. These husks would arise and hunt down the other scientists currently not infected. However, considering that the plant had its own abilities, why would it choose to take this form? In this episode, we will discuss just that as we talk about its lore and morphology behind the plant-based organ. Organism. As with all episodes, we must first discuss exactly how this creature came about before discussing how these dangerous organisms stalk the narrow hallways of the Umbrella Labs looking for delicious heads to take off their shoulders. Naturally, it all began with a flower. See that? Pretty nice callback to my first episode of the T-Virus. This flower was not the progenitor flower, but instead was its own separate plant. We know that the T-Virus is pretty much universally infectious at this point, but its contagious status is honestly through the roof. The T-Virus seemingly is able to infect both plants and animals, so I'm just gonna go ahead and call it. It can probably infect fungi later on whenever they get to that, which might be Resident Evil 7. Anyways, I actually have to learn about that. Plant 42 was essentially the first of its kind to exhibit the traits that were desirable, but its history is fairly extensive. Plant 42 was created by Henry Sarton, who injected a plant living in Point 42 with a T-virus out of curiosity. Plant 42 proved to be completely unique, incomparable to the other plant-based test subjects. Its roots buried deep into the wood and concrete concrete in the residence and began feeding on the chemical-rich water of the aqua ring, likely promoting further growth. Expanding its vines across the building, it used cracks in the flooring to attack passing staff members feeding on their blood. By May 21st, Plant 42 had completely taken over a room of the dormitory. Able to manipulate doorknobs and move its vines, Plant 42 captured and drained several of the researchers of their blood when they tried to destroy it. It was discovered by Sarton's team that Plant 42 was sensitive to a chemical known as UMB number 20, otherwise known as as V-Jolt. A plan was devised to destroy it, involving feeding it directly into its roots. However, this plan would not be accomplished either due to continued deterioration of the researcher's health from the T-virus infection or because the escaped Neptunes in the flooded aqua tank chamber. Plant 42 was finally destroyed on the night of July 24th when the stars reached the dormitory building. This plant, much like the animal cells that the T-virus infects, appears to have a strengthening effect on the tissue regardless of the species that it does actually take over. However, with the plant brought into being, this is clearly of great interest. This flora could be used to further fund Umbrella. Imagine dropping a bunch of seeds onto an enemy stronghold. At first, the people there would probably not really take notice and be like, what did you just drop on us? But eventually, it would be much too late for them to counter the aggressive plant. Based on this information obtained from the Plant 42 fiasco, the eloquently named Plant 43 would come about. This version was smaller and much more mobile. The reason I am making this distinction is there seems to be some confusion as if the researchers are actually Plant 43. Well, they are not. Plant 43 was actually humanoid in shape and would maintain its homo sapiens form. With two legs and two arms, it would walk around patrolling the area by moving water in its body. These changes in pressure in certain areas would simulate muscle contractions, which in turn would give it the trait of locomotion. However, it was extremely sensitive to its environment, much like other plants. Specifically, the ones browning out around my house because it's been close to 100 degrees for the last month with quite literally zero rain. These plants, however, were just that though, only plants. They could adapt to hostile environments, but overall, despite having a humanoid shape, they were not people. The plants in Umbrella, however, were a version of Plant 43 that was much larger. Then we come to why you are actually even watching this video. When Birkin went off the rails, as mentioned previously, everything began to shut down. The plant was sensitive to its environment and as such would attempt to maintain its own life and seek nutrition. Eventually, the plant became hostile towards researchers and survivors who basically hadn't fed it in a while. It would begin turning on the people and using them for food. However, the plant also seems to display a sort of intelligence not seen in, well, plants. While most were desiccated beyond belief or smacked up against the window, it seems that some still had their human form and would play a role post-mortem. Upon a person being used up mostly for plant food, their meat suits would still be used in a way that benefited the plant as a whole. Most muscle and skin were broken down, but it appears as though the interior of the people, who would be known as Ivy, would still retain their inner workings. But we will discuss that momentarily when we get into how the Ivy is still capable of doing what they do. 
too. The plant, in an effort to seek out food and adapt to its surroundings, began sending out seedlings. These seeds would implant into a person, whoever was in the area, and would become something like a parasite. This parasite would begin overriding the body and force it to do the plant's bidding. T-virus still exists in these seedlings as well, meaning that the desiccated body we do see being piloted may be a combination of the T-virus coupled with the plant linking up with that body of that person, extracting the nutrition from them manually. The seedlings, unsurprisingly, are not like normal seedlings, and I mean that should be pretty clear considering what creature we are currently looking at, but it is worth mentioning. When these seeds are implanted into the body, they are able to grow throughout the entire body, sending shoots of vines to collect food. But more importantly, a lot of these vines and roots would end up connecting directly into the stomach of the person. Perhaps their last meal was seen as a desirable quick source of energy. Regardless, the ivy would inundate the area with roots and take in what was needed. The seedlings also have the ability to manipulate the nervous system of a person. Taking over the central nervous system in particular, this means that the seedlings would have access to the somatic nervous system. As we all know, the somatic nervous system is responsible for the body's muscle and control of voluntary movements, as well as the quick reflexes known as the reflex arc. What is the reflex arc? I can already hear you saying. It's when you, say, burn your hand and you pull away before you feel the pain. Essentially, it's the pain signal being interpreted by your spinal cord rather than reporting all the way to the brain and then having to come back down because at that point, cells would start to rupture from the heat and it would cause lots of damage. Anyhow, with these areas taken over by the seedlings, they would need to be able to control the tissue in a way that would allow them to move the body. The body is still very much functional, if not degraded to a large degree. The seedlings would more than likely generate some sort of electrical field to inspire movement within the meat suit. However, judging by how slow the moving and stunted walking is, it would indicate that these seedlings are not necessarily designed to interact with the nervous tissue, but instead may just have a natural ability to do so. So how might it actually do this? Well, believe it or not, all biological cells are somewhat electrical. Plants are known, just like with animals, to produce action potentials inside of their cells to generate an electrical field to pass on to the next cell. Now, it may not cause their bark to contract or anything major like that, but this is not to say that this doesn't exist in plants at all. There is a certain type of plant called a mimosa paducah that will close its leaves when touched. These contractile proteins fold the leaves as a defense mechanism should stimulus be applied. Based on this, this would quite clearly be an action potential generated by the plants in response to its environment. The seedlings would be like the mimosa paducah in terms of contractile proteins minus the proteins. Their nervous system would more than likely come into close contact with ours with the ivy vines branching all over the body. The central nervous system would be wrapped in these vines and this combination of plant and human would benefit the plant quite a bit by using the existing human structures. The same nervous tissue would be reporting different sensory information to the brain, but instead of the brain actually sending back a signal as to what to do, this would more than likely stimulate the nervous system of the plant. In turn, this plant would be able to interact or understand certain signals through the neural tissue. When that happens, it is able to move the body through electrical conduction, causing muscle contractions to attack the target or the original object that induced this stimulus response. It may not be thinking so much that person alive equals food, but instead, much like the ivy vines that reach out into their environment and latch onto objects by natural compulsion, this form of ivy may be reaching out into its environment as well. Of course, the result is much more devastating than a few choked out flowers. So with that pretty extensive botany lesson done, let's get into the morphology of this creature because you know we need to talk about what has happened to this person. Starting with the feet, we see that most of the skin has been removed. Now, as I mentioned previously, the body was more than likely cannibalized to a certain extent, which is why we can see the person actually pulled up into these root structures when we first find them. The skin surrounding the foot was likely quickly broken down and absorbed by the plant's vines to fuel plant 43. Moving up the legs, we can see that the vines tightly wrap around and actually cut through some of the shin skin. Specifically on the right knee exists a sort of pustule, more than likely being an area of plant nervous tissue interacting with the human nervous tissue. Moving further up the legs, we see the muscle has definitely decreased in size as it befell the same fate as the skin. Some of the original pants can still be seen, but mostly the vines have torn these. On the left quadricep, lateral side, we see another area where a yellow orb has formed, again more than likely controlling the leg and its movement. The groin and abdomen area are completely covered with a web of vines and another orb appearing over the right lower quadrant of the abdomen. This may be interacting with the nerves, but due to its location as well, it may actually be a point where nutrition is taken from the stomach and small intestines and distributed through the vine system. Further up the chest area, we see the orbs over the mid chest where the heart sits. Now you have a sternum directly over your heart as the point is to protect that organ and the great veins and arteries in that area. So it being off center would allow it to get into the thoracic cavity by piercing the intercostal muscles. Here it would more than likely help the heart keep beating despite the
despite the fact that the plant feeds on blood. So I'm just sort of spitballing here, but I would assume that the plant has filled the body with some sort of material, allowing the cells to continue cellular respiration and for the heart to pump a substance through it to keep it going. This postural also seems more than likely to control the nerves going towards the left arm. The right arm almost appears to be mostly vines at this point, but it is still there in some form. Two orbs can be seen controlling this area. Why do I keep saying orbs rather than pustules? Because I actually don't like the word and I don't want to say it all that much. The hands are much like the feet and that they have virtually lost all their skin. Instead, long spindly phalanges and carpal bones can be seen. They're still able to grip and grab onto people, so this would mean that the ligaments and tendons are still very much so functional. Moving up to the head, we can see that the brain has no part in this person anymore. The plant is completely running the body at this point as its life support and anything that made this person human has been completely annihilated. The mouth appears to have been moved sideways, which would require the mandible to have been split and some pretty massive alterations to the zygomatic bones as well as the maxilla of the face. The nose is gone as well as replaced by this mouth. Sharp teeth line the sides of the split and it actually continues all the way through the head. Essentially, the head is the mouth. The ocular cavities are still there but have been filled in somewhat, losing the eyes long ago. The head now has the capability to split in half, making it an astronomically larger bite area. The skin is gray and from what I can see, there are no hairs left on its head. Interiorly, this is why the plant needs to control the body as the brain has more than likely begun to have been broken down for nutrition or has already been broken down. In its place, many spiky teeth are seen running throughout. So speaking of the head, let's talk about what happens should anyone get too close. And let's just say it's not a good time to lose one's head when dealing with the IV infected. Should you get bold and run up on this thing, it'll grab you pretty quickly. Unfortunately, this creature doesn't mess around and will go directly for your delicious brain case. It will latch onto your head with all those teeth pointed directly inward around the temporal part of your skull, which believe it or not, does not do so well against sharp pressure. It will then begin chewing your head, making its way through the skull and more than likely hitting your brain fairly easily. When this happens, it will chew a few more times and rip away, destroying a large portion of your cranium, which will also more than likely tear lines into your brain. This would quickly lead to a subdural hematoma, which in turn will drop you like a bad habit. From there, it's free to consume you and fuel the glory of Plant 43. So that about wraps up the Ivy Infected. I hope everyone enjoyed. If you do, leaving a like helps get the video out there and subbing is a great way to stay up to date on what I post. I got some comments about people not being notified. I posted a video on the Regenerator last week from Dead Space 3. So if you want to go watch that, more than welcome to. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord merch, and Patreon links in the description if anybody is interested in that. And I'd like to thank a few of my patrons. Huge shout out to It's Not a Spoon and Laffy No Skill, as well as Freedom Units 44, The Lone Titan, and Justin Hartsock. Thank you guys. And for the rest of my patrons, I thank you as well. You guys are a massive help. Anyhow, that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed the video and I will see y'all in the next one.